uh, here's what is uh, required uh, of you tonight so that you can be equipped uh, for all that uh, I'm going to share. I need you, please, if you have your Bible, uh, there are a lot of verses that I want to uh, proof text uh, for you on tonight, uh, as well as I want you to please take copious notes. Uh, because I want you to be able to refer back to them uh, so that you will gain strength uh, uh, and knowledge and uh, really understanding of where you are in the Word of God uh, and be able to celebrate it. Uh, if you are uh, seated, beside, seated beside somebody you trust, uh, you can, uh, one of you be the designated driver to go through the Bible uh, and the other one take uh, notes. Uh, but I want uh, you to have uh, as much as uh, what I want to share. Uh, just so that I know where it is that I am uh, in terms of context, let me see the hands of those of you who were here on last Tuesday. Uh, lift that hand for me. Wave it for me. Thank you. All right. This is a great class. All right. Let's uh, jump in. And uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, hopscotch around some things before we land uh, in the New Testament in the book of Acts uh, but there are some things that uh, I neglected to give you on last week uh, that I, I really believe is important uh, for you to have. Uh, very rarely do you ever hear uh, in this quote uh, postmodern society, uh, very rarely do you ever hear about the uh, presence of blackness in the Bible uh, because we always want to tout uh, this oneness uh, at the cost of the denial of our own ethnicity. Uh, it is amazing, uh, and I'm going to be on the radio on tonight on uh, why it's only uh, black people that go to white churches. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll unpack that later on tonight. Uh, but uh, now that I have your attention, let me go into Bible study. Uh, that there are promises that God makes expressly uh, to the children, to the sons and daughters of Africa uh, that I want you to have. Uh, the first reference scripturally that I want to take you to, you remember that we laid our anchor down last week uh, in the book of Genesis. I, I want you to go to Psalm 68. Psalm 68. Uh, verse 31. Psalm 68, uh, verse 31. And in Psalm 68, verse 31, uh, it says uh, that envoys will come from Egypt uh, and Cush will submit herself to God. You remember me talking to you on last week uh, that Cush is uh, really uh, another word for Africa. Cush is another word uh, for Africa. Uh, in other translations, early translations uh, of the Bible, you don't find the word Cush. You find the word Ethiopia. Uh, and Ethiopia is not necessarily the nation uh, that we recognize today. Uh, but Africa, before it was Africa, was called Ethiopia. Uh, so it's Ethiopia or Africa shall stretch forth her arms. The original uh, language of that text is so important that I need you to have uh, and not afford for it to be edited out that Ethiopia or Cush shall stretch forth her arms. Here it is to God. That's very important. Will stretch forth her arms uh, to God. Uh, the early church understood this promise. Uh, is that Africa will lead the world in worshiping God. Africa will be the exemplars of what it means to operate in praise, worship, and submission will follow under the blueprint or the pattern of what Africa does. My father who sits amongst you on today, I prophesied some 25 years ago, a day will come that missionaries will come from Africa to America. And I'm believing that that day is going to come uh, very soon. Uh, I uh, was talking to uh, uh, Apostle, uh, Apostle Solomon from uh, West Africa uh, on Saturday, and he was talking about signs and wonders and the power of God. And I asked him, why is it 
uh, that you see that level of miracles and the manifestation of God happen in Africa and you don't see it at the same level in the United States. And he said to me without ever pausing is because in America you have too many options for God. You have too many options for God. What, what does that mean? Uh, is that if in fact I don't have the money, then I'm going to go to the government. If I don't go to the government, I'm going to go to the church. If I don't go to the church, I'm going to go to social services. He says in Africa, we don't have those options. We only go into God. In America, you all go to God as the last resort. Not as the only choice. And Ethiopia shall stretch forth her arms. And so our level of uh, Wakanda worship that I'm using metaphorically uh, suggests to us, are we worshiping like our ancestors? Or are we worshiping like our colonizers? Is it just an option? Or is it our essence, our raison d'etre for being? The Psalms predicted that one day people will recognize the spirituality of Africans. This is what the book of Psalms prophesied is the world will see the glory that rests on Africa and will renew their covenant to God based off of how the Africans worship. Y'all don't believe it? Would you go to Psalms please? I need you in Psalms 87. Psalm 87. Psalm 87. Uh, Media minister we're in verses 3 through 6. Uh, just as an aside of biblical teaching, uh, Psalms, uh, ladies and gentlemen, while it is coupled in the book uh, with the books of wisdom, uh, is that Psalms, friends, uh, is not a book of literature. And as a consequence, Psalm does not have chapters, it is selections. Uh, you hear many preachers get up erroneously uh, and talk about the 87th division or the 150th division. There are only five divisions in the book of Psalms. And so this is really in the nuance is the 87th hymn or is the 87th selection. It is not the 87th chapter. Why? Because it is not a book of literature. Psalms 87 has nothing to do with what I'm teaching you tonight. I just gave that to you as an easy footnote. All right. Psalms 87 verse 3 through 6. Psalm 87, 3 through 6. Media ministry, do we have it? You're working on it. All right. Uh, Psalms 87, uh, 3 through 6. Let me take somebody's Bible. Uh, I'm a poor. Uh, thank you so much. You're my favorite member today. Psalm 87, 3 through 6. Glorify things uh, that are spoken of thee, O city of God. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them uh, that know me. Behold, uh, Philistia and Tyre with Ethiopia. With Eth Ethiopia, this man was born there, and of Zion it shall be said that this man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. That the highest man that is coming will be born in Africa. There is a name above every name. Come on, y'all. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Anybody know his name? Psalm 87 says that the one that is going to be the greatest one to ever be alive will be born out of the womb of Africa. And all these years your colonizers have you worshiping in churches with a stained glass caricature of Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes. That is not the Jesus as prophesied in Psalm 87. Isaiah foretold that God would bring forth a remnant. Watch this. And the remnant will come from Africa. I'm in Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11, 11. Isaiah 11, 11. I want you to get there. Beat me there, please. Isaiah 11, verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant, here's what I like, of his people. 
which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Patras and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea and he shall set up an ensign for the nations. Hear this. All of the nations that I just aforementioned, articulated, and spoken to you is that area around uh, Syria, around Sudan, and around Lebanon. All of them clearly at this time have different names than where it is that you see cited uh, in your scripture, but I'm giving you a geographical location. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcast. The outcast, here's the catch, y'all, of Israel. And gathered together the dispersed of Judah. Now the reason why this is so important is that white evangelicals keep talking to you about the sacredness of the holy land of Israel. And never talk about the Palestinians that have been thrown out. Never talked about, watch this, that Trump's uh, deranged immigration policy is a page from Israel's treatment of Africans. What Isaiah prophesies is, I am not coming back until I am able to restore the Africans that got kicked out of Israel. Do y'all see that in your Bible? Now they ain't reading that, but tell Jerry Falwell, read this one. <laughs> he says, I am coming back for the outcast. Look at it in your Bible. Isaiah chapter 11, verse number 12. I am coming for the outcasts of Israel. Who are the outcasts of Israel, y'all? The Palestinians. This summer, I'm so excited, you all. This is the first time I'm announcing it to you. I'm taking a delegation of black pastors uh, to go visit Palestine to see the ill-fated treatment uh, of our brothers and sisters there and to fight for their right for humanity and decency because all of the westernized church has acted as if the original occupiers are the criminals and not the invaders. So if the white evangelical church is standing up for the Israelites, who's standing with the Palestinians? They not with God? Lord help me. Uh, I, I guess it's a good time for me to announce to you all today. Uh, I got a call uh, on yesterday. Uh, next month in Atlanta, uh, it's going to be televised, I think, on TBN and on Daystar. Uh, Paula White has agreed to debate me on Trump policy. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm looking forward with bated breath. Uh, we're going to shut television down that night. Uh, so uh, it's, it's coming, I think, the end of April. I think it's the last week of April, uh, live from Atlanta. Uh, Y'all pray for me. Pray for me. I'm, I, I can't even tell you how excited I am. I'm, uh, and it's going to be televised. Can I tell y'all, I'm, I'm jumping back and kissing myself. Uh, it's it's going to be great. It says, watch this. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. And Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. He says, I'm coming back for my remnant, those who have been pulled out of Israel, and I am separating the tares from the wait you are going to know my people because my people are the ones that come out of Cush pastor you racist no I'm a biblicist I'm, I'm, I'm reading what the Bible do y'all see that in your Bible Isaiah chapter 11 verse 11 it's amazing I'm telling y'all whenever I talk about a black presence in the Bible or black empowerment y'all got no idea how many trolls come on uh, our internet uh, talking about shut this is not the love of God it is the love of God uh, that God has a heart for the oppressed I, I, I'm not against anybody I'm just for my people all right uh, he says uh, let's go to Isaiah chapter 18 I Isaiah chapter 18. Isaiah chapter 18. Woe to the land shadowing with wings, which is beyond Africa, that sendeth ambassadors by the sea. Y'all is going to get heavy. Y'all don't even understand Isaiah is the prophetic book. Is foretelling what's getting ready to happen. Isaiah chapter 18 says, I am concerned. It's trouble coming for people who live outside of Africa because they are sending ambassadors by sea. They're sending vessels. Do, do y'all see that in the Bible? I don't want y'all to think I'm making this up. They send, watch this, swift messengers to a nation to scatter and peel off the people. 
They are terrible from the beginning. A nation met it out, watch this, to try down my people. All of the inhabitants of the world and dwellers of the earth see, watch this, that I am going to lift them up, the people that were snatched away on boats. Are y'all in Isaiah chapter 18? God help me. Verse number four. Would y'all look at verse number four? Come on, media ministry. We got a whole lot of ground to cover. For so the Lord saith unto me, I will take my rest and I will consider even my dwelling place like a clear heat upon herbs and like a cloud of dew of heat from the harvest. For, for, for after the harvest, when the bud is perfect and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he shall both cut off the springs and the pruning hook and take away and cut down the branches. Shade, they shall be left together unto the fowls of the mountain, unto the the beasts of the earth and the fowl shall summer upon them and all the beasts of the earth shall winter upon them in that time the Lord of hosts is coming watch this for the people that's been scattered <laughs> he said when this comes watch this I am coming for the children of the diaspora all of my children that are in the Caribbean all of them that are in the West Indies all of them that are in the UK, all of them that are in Ukraine, all of them that are in Germany, all of them that are in Switzerland, all of them that are hiding in Canada, all of them that were brought against their will in America. I'm coming for all of them. Why? Because they have been trotted upon underfoot. Their land has been spoiled. Watch this. And I swear on it as I am the Lord of hosts from Zion. God's got a heart. For the people who have been scattered. Does anybody that I've described sound familiar to y'all? Are y'all in Isaiah? Yeah, all right. Biblical scholars are aware that Cush uh, refers uh, to Africa, sometimes uh, to Egypt, uh, sometimes it's called Ethiopia. Uh, Afrocentric uh, philosophers call it Nubia uh, or the land of Cush, uh, and we're going to call it, uh, for all, con all, um, uh, all, all intents and purposes, just call it uh, Africa. All of these lands, biblically, that are discussed uh, in the Word of God are in uh, below the Sudan or what we would call. Uh, in the UN uh, sub-Saharan Africa uh, Africa is cited Africa is cited I want you to write this down 57 times in the word of God 57 times in the word of God all of us has a right to know and applaud the importance that we play in the Bible, especially in a culture and in a country that tried to condition us to believe we had no souls. That the justification of Christian slaveholders is that we were absent of a soul. That the Constitution that we have pledged to in its original documentation said that you and I were just three-fifths of a human being. Three-fifths of a human being, not because of our height, not because of our weight, not because we were absent of any limbs or digits, but because they rationalized to themselves we had no soul, not realizing that they got soul from us. So those of you who were here on uh, last week, I talked to you about the Garden of Eden. Uh, I talked to you about the three different references uh, about black women uh, in the Bible, uh, both with uh, Moses' wife. Uh, I talked to you uh, about uh, Song of Solomon, uh, and the half has not been told. Uh, but I got to give you just one last piece uh, before we uh, walk over uh, into the New Testament. And the piece uh, that I ran by on last week that I thought was so critical for you you to have uh, was Song of Solomon. I don't know how I forgot this last week. Would you go to Song of Solomon chapter 1? Song of Solomon chapter 1. And I only want to look at verse number 5 and then when I leave out of here all of us are running to the book of Acts. No, let's Song of Solomon first for Acts. Now, this text is so amazing. 
so amazing uh, that I wish every Christian black person knew Song of Solomon 1 verse 5. I wish you knew it by heart. I mean, this really is the cornerstone of the whole Harlem Renaissance. Everything that Claude McKay, everything that Langston Hughes wrote, I'm telling you, is an echo chamber of Song of Solomon 1 and 5. Song of Solomon 1 and 5, plagiarized by Zora Neale Hurston. Maya Angelou, County Cullen, all of it comes from Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse number 5. Watch this. It's so important. It's so vital. And I repent to you as your pastor that in all these years, I've never had you read it. So tonight, I got to wash my hands of that guilt and shame. Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 1, verse number 5. Come on, let's everybody, will you read it with me aloud? Stop right there! That ain't James Brown. Come on. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Do y'all see it? Do y'all see that? That ain't public enemy. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse number 1. Come on, everybody. Would you read that out loud? Stop right there. Now, those of you all who were in church Sunday at 930, can I see your hand? If you are at uh, 930, say, wave that hand at me, pull that hand down, put it back up. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse number 5. Don't you wish, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse number 5, don't you wish your daughter learned this in Sunday school? God, I, now I'm, I'm, I'm reading this out the Bible. Don't you wish this was a part of the core curriculum or understand it for every black girl who came through vacation Bible school? That before she put on a brownie uniform or Girl Scout troop, that she knew Song of Solomon 1 and 5? Come on, y'all. Everybody, let's read it together. Dark am I, yet lovely. Daughters of Jerusalem. Stop! <laughs> we ain't talking about one girl. All the dark girls are lovely. God, I wish y'all would catch this revelation. I wish y'all would see what this means. Would you just point uh, at another sister in the room and say, did you know you was in the Bible? <laughs> what would that mean for our self-esteem, for our morale, uh, for our understanding of self-worth and worthiness? Uh, just to know I am dark and lovely. Watch this, because God said so. It's a whole hair care line based off a of song of Solomon 1 and 5. You've been going to CVS not even knowing you was getting a box of the Bible. <laughs> song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. I know I'm right. Thank you. Song of Solomon 1 and 5. Watch this. Persons of African uh, descent appear, watch this, as lovely. And going back to Song of Solomon 1 and 5, it shows that going back to Bible days, I had to, I had to defend my beauty. This racism ain't new. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. Did this did one just manufactured over the last 400 years? Ever since you were a believer in black, you've been under attack. They didn't start with the alt-right, the Republicans. It didn't start with Trump or the Klan. By virtue of the fact that this got to be a song all the girls in the church got to sing in Jerusalem. All of us are beautiful. We dark and we lovely. Come on, y'all. And it then goes on. Put that verse back on for me. Uh, it says, uh, dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. You know what I'm saying? It was the greatest insult in middle school. You black as the street. Now that you got fighting coming. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to show you. But these girls that are singing in Song of Solomon, watch this, are looking for the blackest things around them. The tents are black, black like me. And that's my sign of pride. What would that do for our self-esteem when you realize, I can't keep repeating it again, that four black girls in 2018 have committed suicide this year under 16 from being bullied in public school, not feeling beautiful, not seeing their self-work. What would happen if the authentic church began to teach and understand and underscore my beauty is in my blackness. And I can find it in the Bible to justify that I am not a curse. 
I am not an accident. But the song says he's intentional. Come on, I can't hear anybody in, in, anybody in here glad to be the color you are. And knowing that I'm fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Who, what am I that you are mindful of me? That you have made me just a little bit lower than the angels. Watch this. And making me a little bit lower than the angels? I'm black. God, help me. Then what color are the angels? Y'all looking at Charlie's angels. That's the wrong episode. <laughs> Lord, help me fighting with you. That couldn't have been a white angel. That had to have been a black angel. All right, let's go to the New Testament, please. Let's go to the New Testament. So Africa, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want you to think uh, is left in the Old Testament. But I want to drag it into the New Testament. And uh, I want to spend uh, the balance of my time uh, in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Would you go there please? And where we find ourselves in Acts chapter 8, uh, we're going to begin uh, around verse 26. Acts chapter 8 verse 26. Is, uh, uh, there are small nuances uh, that are so important to, that I have to undo uh, your brainwashing is so important small nuances that you're reading that I'm not sure that you understand which really resonates on the value and the importance of the fictitious place called Wakanda why pastor because this land of Kush that we know as Africa is not a nation it's not a country we talking about the whole continent but watch the language of it is that Kush is a kingdom and that's so important. Why? Because every time you're seeing portrayals of Africa, you just see in villages. <laughs> you just seeing our people struggling and poor and looking for a dollar a day to get water. And what you spend on coffee, you could feed five African kids for 79 cents. Because you don't understand the vast wealth and the power uh, and the splendor and the opulence that was in the kingdom of Africa before the invaders came on ships. The kingdom of Cush, watch this, comes to roll uh, in the New Testament where we read the conversation of Candace's treasurer. And this is so important that you have a kingdom that's run by a queen. She's so valuable, so important, and really, you all, I, I, I could teach on this uh, for weeks on end, uh, but what is so important is that the conversation that takes place is with her Ethiopian treasurer. Several different slight nuances that are so significant for us is that the kingdom has resources. They have wealth. They have means. But what is so important is that the treasurer is a eunuch. The treasurer is a eunuch. What does that mean? Is that the eunuch is without their reproductive organs. Without their reproductive organs. Why is it without their reproductive organs, Manga Cola? Is because the people who are around the money all have to be crash castrated. All have to be castrated. Why? Because without your reproductive organs, you are absent of your passion. So you're around a woman who is in charge and you're around wealth. So now let us cut off the thing that defines you. Because we don't want you to have passion. One of the amazing uh, best books I've read in 2018 uh, is uh, the book by Dick Gregory uh, called Reading in Between the Lines. I want you to please read this book. I want you to put it, I know I've given you a whole lot of books, but this one I'm telling you, I need you to read it. Do me a favor, make your children read it. Uh, but he talks uh, about uh, several uh, different historical uh, footnotes that happen, uh, one of which is important uh, that lends itself credence to our text tonight. Uh, in Acts is uh, Dick Gregory gives the story, uh, Anthony, of George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver, you all know, uh, found the peanut and has over 186 different patents. What many of you may not know is that George Washington Carver was adopted by a white family. 
adopted by a white family, let me go a step further, uh, a Lutheran pastor. Let me go a step further, and the congregants of that church had a problem with him adopting a black orphan. So how in the world are you going to let this black boy live in your house, watch this, when you got a white daughter? You open yourself up for attack. As a consequence, what many of you all don't know is George Washington Car Carter was castrated. Castrated at 12 years of age. As a consequence, he always talked in a soprano voice because he lost all of his testosterone. He put all of his energy, all of his efforts, all of his mind around science. Why? Because that was the only place he could have passion. Because he got castrated. Do you know how many of our fathers got castrated on the plantation? So that their only focus could be on tobacco, on cotton, on cane sugar. Have no passion for the children I just had to watch get auctioned off. Have no passion, hear this, for you having to sit there while I rape your wife. So the whole process of what it is that we have seen in America, we call it now the emasculation of men. But it's really, watch this, the castration of men. What is happening where we are castrating our men where we don't want our men to be passionate? That then finds itself seeping into the contemporary church. Where churches do not allow men to be men unless they worship like women. Sunday you all heard me give an appeal uh, that our uh, liturgical dance group, Poetry and Motion, 30, 40 of them strong dancing, giving unto the Lord, and the Lord dropped in my spirit. How come it's only women dancing before me? How come only women lifting up the flag? Because we have castrated worship and made worship now in the feminine tense. That in order for me to worship God, I got to act like a woman. God, I can't hear anybody. So I, I can't even go into it without me having petitioners outside. And so what we are watching in the last 25 years is the feminization of the church. That I, men can't find a role in worship unless they work security. Because security is the only place the church allows a man to be a man. All right. Uh, can I go on the X, please? Y'all look like y'all got a headache. <laughs> <laughs> can can, can y'all take more? Y'all need a nap? All right. Uh, so Queen Candace, watch this, is known in historical documents as the Queen Mother of Nubia or the Queen of Africa. Where it is that her palace or her headquarters rested or where her White House or the capital was is presently in Sudan. What is amazing, ladies and gentlemen, is that these, watch this, are Africans, but when they're doing government business, they're speaking Greek. Did y'all hear what I just said? They're speaking Greek in the court. That's how it is that they're operating in Robert's Rules of Order, going through protocol and procedure as Africans, watch this, they are bilingual and proficient. And they are speaking, watch this, not the language of their captors, but the language of their business partners. Because their business partners don't know how to use oil. Their business partners don't know how to do irrigation. Their business partners don't understand the nuances to farming and agriculture and mining. Y'all not saying anything. First indoor bathrooms are in Africa. First running water is in Africa. And so when it is that they're doing business, watch this. They are in fact speaking Greek. Why? Because the stenographer is Greek. The stenographer is Greek and is taking record to take back home to show them how to run governmental structure. All of this you can find in the book called Stolen Legacy by G.M. James. Stolen Legacy. G.M. James. It's part of our introductory uh, reading. All of us had to read this our first week 
of orientation at Morehouse College. Stolen Legacy by G.M. James. Would you please write that book down? It's another one uh, I'm adding to your reading list. It was Candace's friends who wielded real political and military power from her capital city, watch this, while her son served as the religious figurehead. She's over government. Watch this. And she is not grooming her son to be her successor. She is grooming her son, hear this, to lead worship. God, y'all are missing this. She's the queen of Africa. And she says, watch this, the highest honor I can give my son is to prepare him to work for God. She's the most critical, pivotal figure in political history at the time. And she says, what I do is good. But what an incredible honor if I can raise my son to serve God. When I grew up uh, in the church, and I'm just realizing this now, even while teaching it, is that uh, we used to have uh, something that we, we've never instituted in all of our years of being in the church. We used to have altar aids. Altar aids used to come down, lead the procession. One of us hold the Bible. The other one hold the wick for the candles. And we got to wear robes with the pastor. Because <laughs> that, that was our training ground. So our training ground, why is We never got the mic. Our one job, our one job was stay awake through service. <laughs> now, we were nowhere on the program. They didn't call on us to do anything. Our job is we are leading in the processional. When I was coming up, it was only male altar aides. Because we were raising up a generation of young men uh, that would one day be in ministry. Can't even tell you now, one of them uh, is Bishop uh, Durant Harvin. Uh, all of us started out as altars. Our first access to that which was holy was lighting a candle. Are, are y'all understand? I, I got to ask yourself, and I'm, I'm now uh, laying myself down on the panoply of observation, is what are we doing to groom another generation of black men for servitude for that which is sacred? Next week we host an annual conference. I'm embarrassed to tell you that three-fourths of those that are coming through for ordination are all women. You look in this corner pocket of my sons and daughters in ministry, three-fourths are all women. That's all great. That's, I'm great for women leading worship, preaching, operating in their gifts. But the question is, why aren't we raising sons? We're the sons in the gospel. Most of you bring your daughters to church and leave your sons at home. Because you don't have the vision of Queen Candace. I want to raise a son that wants to live for God. The royal mother, watch this, Candace, as we know her, watch this, make gifts, watch this, to give unto God. And sent people she could trust into Jerusalem to bring the gifts. The art of civilization uh, came, watch this, from Candace setting the precedent. So Queen Candace set up diplomacy and etiquette. Queen Candace, watch this, began the template for what we now know as the United Nations. Of bringing all the different nations of Africa together to make sure that there was no warfare and she was the one that would mediate all peace agreements. And would meet out, watch this, all of the discipline, disciplinary measures for those who broke the peace accord. So all of that level of diplomacy, watch this, was on the shoulders of a black woman. And yet your job is scared to promote you. <laughs> yet we still got churches that make women read the scripture from the floor. And only allow sisters to preach on Mother's Day. And it can't call it a sermon, it's an address. Come on, y'all got to stay with me. So here is Queen Candace who's operating with that level of authority. Hear this, of military strength, of political prowess. Why? Because Queen Candace operated in a high level of commerce. At that time, ladies and gentlemen, all of the corn, all of the oil, and all of the wool came out of Cyrene. 
All of the corn, all of the oil, all of the wool comes out of Cyrene, which is under the immediate dispatch of Queen Kansas. I'm going to wrap this up in such a pretty bow. I, I hope y'all appreciate it. If I was in seminary, they'd be giving me a high five right now. Now, is, is, are all of the corn, are all of the oil, all of the wool comes out of Cyrene. Pastor, you got to help me. Where, where, where have I heard that name before? That sounds so familiar to me. From where the cotton is? Are y'all getting this? From where the cotton is? Cyrene? Where's that from? Y'all remember Jesus was struggling on a cross. Trying to get it up the hill. And they found one man. Come on now. Simon, where's he from? Cyrene. He's from the place where they got cotton. Come on, y'all. Y'all thought this started in South Carolina. <laughs> they picked the black man who'd been picking cotton to carry the cross. <laughs> the last one to serve God before crucifixion was a black man. And Ethiopia shall stretch forth her arms. I want it recorded. Y'all are missing this. How can I serve God? I want to be the last one to do it. Everybody else got there early. I want to be chosen to serve God. And the one that could handle the cross without dropping it is a black man. God, I'm I don't know what's wrong with y'all. Y'all still got uh, daylight savings time. Y'all still mad about that one hour. Come on now. So watch this. All of the main commodities that are happening out of Cyrene, Candace is over. The citizens of Cyrene roamed all through the Mediterranean, all through the merchants. Uh, watch this. All of the philosophers, all of the orators, all of the mercenaries, all of the entertainers came out of Cyrene. Y'all missed that. I'll give it to you again. All of the best athletes. <laughs> all of the best entertainers. Are y'all getting any of this? All of the best orators, all of the best salespeople, all came out of Cyrene. All of them were under Candace. Um, the reason why this is so important, watch this, is because they had such deep ties with Jerusalem. They had such deep ties with Jerusalem. So the people of Cyrene, y'all not going to believe it, the people of Cyrene were, in fact, the original Jewish community. So the black Hebrew Israelites are half right. They have right. It began and emanated with us, but we lost our territory when we lost our minds. We are the architects of civilization. We are the mothers and fathers of the earth. And yet, we keep assuming a subservient posture. So the original covenant that God makes with the seed of Abraham are the people who are sitting next to you tonight. And so watch this. The Jewish people, as they claim them to be now, are just the joint heirs. We are the original heirs. God, I, I know this is getting ready to upset some people. And so the synagogue, watch this, uh, of the Cyrenians, watch this, set the standard of how you worship from the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies. All of that is found in Cyrene or in Jerusalem. All of your worship, watch this, points back to God and it set the template for worship for the Jewish community, for Catholicism, and for Protestants, and yet they got the nerve to fool you into believing you're barbaric. They learned all of it from you. You ain't meet no Europeans that color coordinated. <laughs> All of that set design and the drapes and what color the curtains are and how thick they got. That's got Africa written all over it. You don't even recognize yourself in the Bible. The missionary agency, watch this. The missionary agency uh, of Queen Candace then set 
out agents all over, watch this, to do exploits to find Anthony business opportunities. So Queen Candace, watch this, began the whole notion of free enterprise. So Queen Candace is sending envoys out to find out who needs textile, who needs wool, who needs cotton, because what it is that we have is too much for us to be local. So globalization began with Africans. And it started, can I go a step further, with Christian Africans. Now the question that I've got to ask you as critical thinkers is twofold. Number one, how is it that you are a black Christian and you don't do business? Number two, I got to ask you, how is it that you have any semblance of consciousness and claim Christ? Hear me, and you only think locally. There's got to be something in you that pushes you to understand to the uttermost there's a great call on my life. Because Ethiopia is not closing her hand, she's stretching forth her arms. The missionary agency, watch this, is how do I set it forth? So here is the problem. The problem is that this Ethiopian eunuch is riding on the chariot because he done gone to Jerusalem, watch this, to take notes about what happened in church. And they gave him a Bible. Come on, I'm bringing it all together for you now. But the Bible that they gave him is all in Greek. And so the Lord pulls his spirit on a man by the name of Philip and says, go after that African Ethiopian eunuch. And he starts chasing y'all. This got to be an African that can run on his two feet and catch up with a chariot. <laughs> y'all ain't never watched a marathon. Who coming in first? Anybody from the Ukraine winning no <laughs> marathon? That's some Kenyan with no shoes on. Ain't nobody who won the New York Marathon got a Nike endorsement. Because they not wearing shoes. Y'all not saying nothing. So the Lord says to Philip, go catch up with the African eunuch. So he's running. Watch this. An African eunuch that works for Queen Candace. He's reading. Here it is. The, the, uh, the book of Isaiah. The prophetic book I just told y'all about. That God is coming back for the remnant that has been displaced, that has been downtrodden, the one that has been thrown out. And he's reading it and don't know what he's reading. And Philip said, do you know what you're reading? And watch the black man who's got a mind to learn but has never had the opportunity to learn. How can I learn if nobody will teach me? That is the heart of our black men in this community that really got a heart towards God. But because we become so elitist after you done memorized five scriptures, you want to talk down on other people. But you won't give instruction and illumination and education. And they're asking simply, how will I know black people are in the Bible unless you teach me? How will I know that this ain't a white man's religion unless you teach me? How, how will I know that Jesus is the only way and is not just some prophet, no messenger, but is the savior of the world unless you teach me? How will I know that American Christianity is not authentic biblical Christianity unless you teach me? And Philip said, let me give you instruction. But he couldn't do it if nobody taught him. And Jesus said, I need you to go and make disciples. He didn't say, I need you to go make trustees. Need you to become cell group leaders. Who are you running after? <laughs> Who in our community are you enlightening and instructing and educating and empowering? And you can't do that if we ain't reading the word of God and reading it. Watch this undiluted. And he says, watch this. And Candace, uh, treasurer, who is the Ethiopian eunuch, he is the secretary of treasury for all of Africa. You know he don't work for Trump because he done had this job for more than six months. <laughs> he done had this job for more than six months. And uh, uh, the African eunuch says to Philip, come up. I'm lifting you up. Watch this. And here's the part that goes against the grain of our psychosis is the man, watch this, with, with money has no power. 
And a whole lot of what we do on Cynthia in terms of evangelism, we only do evangelism to people we think are poor. We only do evangelism to people we think are uneducated, unexposed. But what Acts shows us is the one that needed evangelism the most is the one that had culture. God help me. So a lot of our evangelism has to be not just to blacks in the projects, but blacks in the suburbs. Who don't know what they reading. <laughs> Let me give you one last point and uh, uh, then we'll, 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 we'll come around the mountain. Uh, uh, Clementine, uh, out of the early uh, Church of Alexandria, was a, a Christian philosopher whose keen responsibility was just to win pagan intellectuals to Christ. Uh, he uh, directed, watch this, the school at Alexandria uh, and the school of Timbuktu going back to the years 185 to 254. And outside of giving them philosophy, he gave them the basic structures of the Pentateuch, 185 to 284. He said, my ministry, watch this, to evangelize people who have exposure but are in darkness. And part of what it is that we're called to do is we don't even understand that Satan's new incubator is the academy. Is you don't even know how many pre preachers we lost from seminary who no longer believe in the word of God uh, because they are looking at the Bible as a critical work to be examined and not to be accepted. It is our conviction that the word of God is the infallible, irrefutable word of God. I don't care what your opinion is. I don't care what the culture dictates. This is the word of God. This is our textbook. And so if in fact you're doing all this new age science and lighting candles and ruining chimes and doing meditation music, but you ain't in this, come on now, then you are not really standing on what God represents. A preacher uh, that I know, that I love and respect it, got up in his church last Sunday uh, and said to his church is that we've got to stop this division in believing Jesus is the only way to heaven. God have mercy on our souls. Said it on a Sunday morning in church. I came to tell you here at our church, I can't say for nowhere else, but Jesus, black Jesus is the way the truth and the life and no man comes to the father but by him now if you want other stuff y'all can go anywhere else but if you want the truth the whole truth so help me God I'm gonna give it to you every Sunday every Tuesday out of the word of God that was written by black people but edited by white people that wanted to keep us in bondage but he that the sun set free shall be free indeed if you believe it come on give God some glory for what God is doing and what he's saying I want you to lift up that hand I didn't mean to keep you this long I'm over time again y'all done got me riled up lift up that hand please <laughs> every Sunday is Savior's Day amen lift up that hand please good and gracious God thank you for making us what we look like <laughs> thank you that when we look in the mirror we are reminded that we were made in your image made in your likeness and made watch this to serve and worship you we appreciate you God that you chose us to have this hair chose us to have these lips chose us to have this skin chose us to have this waistline for that God we give you glory for making us dark and lovely and those of you that receive it for yourselves would you give God glory Come on, I said, would you give God glory?